Hi everyone, so I'm here to talk about a design pattern that I don't like. Um, there, some, it's something that you see a lot in a lot of designs. That was the previous talk, uh, we had a great description of them, talk a little more about how they work before I talk about why they don't work. Um, you see them in a lot of protocols for cross-chain atomic exchanges. You see them in protocols for payment channel uh, networks like Lightning. Um, but they have these downsides, some of which I think are familiar and some of which aren't uh, that familiar. So when I started working with HGLCs about a year ago, I had a lot of headaches until I was convinced by Evan Schwartz and Interledger that they're a bad idea and that they'd actually developed a better way to do it. So I'm not affiliated with Interledger. This isn't an Interledger uh, talk. It isn't, we're not going to cover most of um, the Interledger protocol or, or uh, what I think, including things I like about it. Um, this is about one specific design decision that they make that replaces HGLCs um, and that I think is really cool and that I've considered it for the past year my mission to elevate the, uh, the people's familiarity with this. So what is the problem that HGLCs solve? A lot of people talk about it solving the problem of atomicity, but really atomicity is the means to an end. What HGLCs actually solve is the problem of fair exchange. So if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, this is a scene where Indy is trying to get across a, um, uh, a, a pit and his guide uh, tells him, if you throw me the idol, the thing that they've, that they've you know, rescued from here, I'll throw you the whip so you can get across. And obviously, Indy doesn't really have a choice there, but he has no way to guarantee that when he throws over the idol that uh, the, his um, assistant will throw over the whip to him, and of course he doesn't. So that doesn't work out so well for the assistant in the movie, but in a payment channel network often, uh, if you, you could, would be able to steal money from somebody by having them make a payment to, uh, to you and you don't make a, a corresponding payment either back to them or to someone or to another currency or to someone else. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Now if we're all on the same ledger, uh, it's actually very trivial to solve this. And back when I used to be a traveling block, blockchain salesman, this is what I would always tell people is a huge benefit of blockchains is that look, you can have all your assets on the same ledger. Um, and then here we can do just a die to ETH trade where it's all in one transaction and you know that it won't, uh, part of it won't complete unless the other part completes. But it turns out that's not even realistic, even in the blockchain world. In fact, in blockchains, we have a lot of ledgers that are completely unrelated to each other and um, you have assets that are only on one ledger and not on another. And so uh, trying to actually do atomic transactions across these different ledgers um, is a problem. So in order to illustrate exactly how that works, I'm gonna, um, just in keeping with the destiny of that currency, use Litecoin as the example and talk about a cross-chain atomic swap between Bitcoin and Litecoin. So um, here we have, uh, suppose, let's just suppose we're doing an on-chain payment from Alice to Bob um, in Bitcoin that's being traded for Bob's Litecoin. So uh, Alice could go first and make a payment of one Bitcoin to Bob, but then obviously Bob could cheat Alice by not making the payment. Bob could go first, but then Alice could, uh, but then Bob, uh, Alice could cheat Bob by not making the Bitcoin payment. So we need a protocol for, to make sure that both of these, uh, that, that these, uh, this value is exchanged fairly. So what um, people came up with uh, in, originally for cross-chain atomic swaps, um, and this ends up being used for other uh, kinds of atomicity is uh, HGLCs. So HGLC stands, I think, for hash time lock contracts. People use it differently in many different ways, and honestly, I'm here to bury them, not to explain them, so I'm, I, you know, I'm fine with whatever that. We're just going to call it HGLCs. It's like the SET. It doesn't stand for anything anymore. HGLCs are a means for providing cross-ledger atomic transactions where either of these uh, transactions both complete or neither do. And note that I'm not saying cross-chain atomic transactions, I'm saying cross-ledger, because these ledgers can be payment channels. They could be different kinds of, of ledger, but what matters is it's providing atomicity across these multiple things. So this is a uh, smart contract language. We developed a chain called Ivy, and this is just an illustration of what um, an HGLC does. And I like James Presswitz's explanation of um, how HGLCs work, which is there's two ways that they can be completed. Either the recipient of the HGLC, one of the parties, can complete the HGLC and receive the payment by revealing a secret, or the sender can cancel it after a timeout. And the, uh, these, this is, so this is like an example of one HGLC, so there's gonna be one of these on each chain, and they're used as part of a two-phase commit protocol um, for, for these two, uh, things to, these two uh, transactions to happen atomically. So the way this works, and a lot of you I'm sure have seen this before, um, first, someone creates a, uh, an HGLC on the Bitcoin, Alice creates an HGLC on the Bitcoin network that's going to Bob, um, but Bob will need to reveal Alice's secret to retrieve it. Bob sees that and then he's able to lock up uh, 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 100 LTC on the Litecoin network, completely unrelated network with the same uh, hash, um, but a shorter timeout, a 24 hour timeout 
Alice now has 24 hours to reveal her secret to complete that uh, HLC, and then Bob now knows the secret that he can use to, re uh, to retrieve Alice's, the Bitcoin that Alice put in the, in the HLC on the Bitcoin network. So this is the happy case. This is what happens um, when Alice actually does reveal the secret, but what happens if Alice doesn't reveal the secret? Bob has to wait 24 hours and then can retrieve the money from the HLC, and then Alice gets uh, her money back after 48 hours. So these timeouts can be a little different. I'm using the default um, Lightning uh, HLC timeout of, of 24 hours, uh, but you really can't go that short. Uh, it's not 24 hours, it's like 144 blocks, but yeah, you can't go that short um, on it because the, someone needs time to actually see something on one chain and, or, on, or from one payment channel closing or anything like that and uh, to have time to actually go close it on the other and um, you know, be able to get it included in a block. So there's, a, there's really sort of a limit on how short you can make these timeouts, and that's important. So how do we, um, you know, how, how else can this be used? So right here we used it to do a cross-chain atomic swap, but if you just change a little bit about this thought experiment, you can, by changing the ultimate recipient from Alice, who's also the ultimate sender, to Charlie, this now becomes a cross-chain atomic payment where Alice is paying Charlie, but Alice is sending Bitcoin and Charlie's receiving Litecoin. So the example I like to use for this is this is kind of like a decentralized or trustless shapeshift where there's a, you know, the payment currency doesn't have to be the same as the, as the receipt currency. And these don't have to be on chains. These can be, HTLCs can be embedded within payment channels. And the mechanism for this is, isn't a talk about payment channels, but the mechanism for this, um, somewhat complicated, but you can, you can have, um, you know, do these uh, ledgers, these ledger updates where the ledgers themselves are payment channels um, and, the, uh, and the, the payment is, is happening atomically. So this is how Lightning works. Um, these these, these multi-hop payment channels where here in this example, Alice is sending a, a payment to Dave and um, it's got one Bitcoin payment to Dave and it is just hopping across a bunch of different um, payment channels. So um, the way this works in terms with the HTLCs is first Alice creates an HTLC with Coinbase, Coinbase creates one with Kraken, Kraken creates one with Bob. This is where Alice and Coinbase have a, uh, a payment channel and Kraken and Bob have a payment channel. So somewhat realistic example here, you could imagine how a payment channel could look like in practice. Um, then to complete the payment, Bob reveals the, uh, a pre-image, receives the money, Kraken uh, reveals that pre-image to Coinbase, receives the money, Coinbase reveals the pre-image to Alice, and receives that money. And at any point, if there's a dispute here, you can actually exit the payment channel and go to the main chain and settle it there. Um, again, the, the, uh, it's a little complex there, but what really actually matters here is this dynamic where you see sort of the, all this money gets locked up along this chain, and then when Bob reveals it, it all uh, sort of uh, ripples back. And so um, I don't know if this is why uh, Light the Lightning Network is called this, but I always like to use Lightning as an example of this because I think it's really cool. If you don't know, Lightning doesn't, really go down. You can see here these, uh, these, oh, oh, let me get this to happen. Um, yeah, so you can see here that, well, this unfortunately the video, oh, yeah, here it is. So um, when you see these paths of the ions going down, this isn't the lightning strike. This is just sort of like a pathfinding thing. Lightning actually strikes up. Lightning goes backward, and it's just like, this payment here, where you're locking up payments, you can see just the lightning kind of going down and forking all across the HTLC network, and then the payment completes backward. So uh, that's one way, that's a way to remember it. I don't, again, I don't know, I've never asked Joseph if that's actually why they call it uh, lightning network, but um, I think it's, 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 it's a good way to remember that. So what is um, lightning? One thing I've realized is a lot of people who even who are pretty familiar, people who use lightning, don't really think of it the way that I think of it, um, and I think this is a helpful way is that lightning is really composed of two ingredients and they're, they're composable, but they're separate. Um, payment channels give you off-chain bilateral ledgers between two parties, and HTLCs give you any cross-ledger cross atomic transactions. And so what this gives you is these cross-ledger atomic transactions where the ledgers are not public chains, they're just uh, payment channels. And HTLCs are the part we're talking about here, not payment channels. I love payment channels. HTLCs are the problem, um, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So why, I keep saying HTLCs are a problem, why am I saying that they're a problem? Um, so there's, there's three, there's a, there's a lot of reasons, and you know, it's a, it's a, uh, I could get into, into a lot of detail about some, some of the more particular ones, but I think there's three big categories of problem um, with HLCs. So the first one is the free option problem. This one's gone mainstream actually pretty recently, um, which I'm excited about. Um, people have been, talk, have been sort of like realizing it more. The, uh, so the problem here is, remember, we had Alice, the, the path of an HLC is that Alice first um, locks up hers, and then um, Bob locks up his, and when we're doing a multi, this, is what, this matters when we're doing a multi-asset uh, um, uh, HGLC. So 
Usually Alice is supposed to complete the payment immediately, but what if that instead Alice just sits and watches the price of, uh, just sits on coin market cap and watches the price of, of BDC versus uh, LTC uh, for 23 hours? They now have a choice. If they see Bitcoin rise relative to Litecoin, that means that the trade is no longer economic, um, but potentially, at the price that they, that they made it at. So they can actually just let the HTLC time out and cancel the trade. Um, in the unlikely event that Litecoin actually rises, Alice can complete the HTLC and get the original price that she was quoted. So Alice has basically entered into a financial agreement with, a, with Bob called a, an American-style call option, where she has this, uh, she gets this right to complete the trade or not based on how the price moves, and that's worth something to her. That's worth a premium, but that's that she's not actually paying um, typically when she's, when she's doing an HTLC. In fact, um, on Lightning, if you're doing, if you fail an HTLC, you actually don't pay any fee for it at all, um, which is, uh, which means that you know it, it can you can really sort of do this effective attack on this. So people have been uh, have been recognizing this. Uh, my good friend Ziminisikipja uh, said this on the Lightning Dev list uh, like about a, m a month ago, and uh, he put it as an argument for a single asset Lightning Network because this problem doesn't really affect it when you're only dealing in a single asset because the price of Bitcoin versus the price of Bitcoin um, doesn't really change. Um, it's, it's a very good analysis. I'd recommend going to look at it. Um, he doesn't propose the solution that I like. Um, in it, but, uh, and he doesn't also talk about one of the other problems, and this is one that affects a, uh, a griefing, uh, a, even a single asset uh, lightning network, and that's the griefing problem. So let's remember how this, uh, these arrows go. Again, lightning going down to the path being found, and we're like just waiting for the lightning to strike, but what if it just doesn't? And Bob just says, I'm not completing the HLC, I'm just holding on to my, to my pre-image. Now everybody's money is stuck all day. Like, the, this, is, you know, this is money. Now, Alice maybe knew what she was getting into, sending this payment to Bob, but we now have this relationship between Coinbase and Kraken, where they maybe have this payment channel that's doing a bunch of routing. They have one Bitcoin stuck in this payment channel that they can't use for any other payments for 24 hours. That's just a feature of the system. Um, and this doesn't necessarily look that bad. Look, maybe Coinbase and Kraken, they got a lot of money. They can, they can sort of uh, wait it off. But this doesn't have to be just a two-hop payment. This could be just a 20-hop payment. And uh, you know, Bob could have constructed this path specifically in order to mess with everybody that he wants to mess with along the line. Um, and this is a way that someone could take down the Lightning Network only locking up like, one of their own Bitcoin for about 24 hours, but causing um, 20 times that amount of loss because it happens on every hop of the, uh, of the path uh, along the way. Um, and this is something that you know, someone in the middle here just has, they don't know Bob. Um, they're, ju they're just like, they're just routing this payment, and they just, they didn't sign up to have their, this one Bitcoin uh, locked up for a full day, and they don't even receive a fee for it because it gets canceled. So that's a, that's the griefing problem. Um, there's a, a, one more problem, and this is one that I think uh, really was the one that affected me most because I was trying to actually implement HTLCs in something, um, and that's that embedding HTLCs in payment channels and using HTLCs in general is, is, is kind of complicated. Um, one of the things is that it, it depends on a lot on what kind of features you can support in your payment channel. It depends on what kind of features you can support on the base ledger. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a pain to actually settle them. Um, and it's expensive. On Bitcoin, you have to like, do a few transactions in order to, to settle an HGC. And that costs around, by the default, uh, with the default values for, the, um, for HGCs, I think that can cost around 50 cents on Bitcoin, um, depending on the, depends on really on what transaction fees you're paying. But, that means that, you know, the, the, the doing, one thing this means is that doing smaller payments uh, than this with HTLCs isn't economical, and that's why, uh, that's something I'll, I'll get back to in a second. So, okay, I've just, you know, broken you all down, now I'm going to build you back up. What uh, am I proposing as the alternative? And that's packetized payments. This is a piece of what's been developed in the Interledger protocol. The Interledger protocol is a very cool um, protocol, again, I don't have enough time to talk about it, but uh, it was developed by the people at Ripple. Um, but it, it's, it's an independent protocol for doing essentially a lightning-like payment channel network, but potentially across uh, uh, many, a much wider set of assets. Um, and this particular design decision that I really like, again, is called packetized payments. And you can maybe tell from the name that it takes some inspiration from uh, packet switching networks, which is part of the history of the internet. When uh, the internet was originally being developed, a lot of file sharing was done over connections, over dedicated connections between computers. And you'd imagine, you could sort of think, again, this is, this is way oversimplification, because I don't have a computer science degree, so I have no idea how this actually works. But if you imagine just like someone sends a file, you just be able to send a file, you try to send the whole file um, to, some, to somebody, you know, and you have a dedicated connection across maybe a bunch of, of hops um, to this party, and you're sort of sending uh, the whole file in, in um, a row to them. Instead, 
Uh, instead of sending in one big chunk, we split it up into tiny packets. We sort of switch them around. Um, and it doesn't matter what order they arrive in. It doesn't matter um, if some of them get dropped because you can, just, you can just restore them. I don't know how well I did there. I'm just terrified of that. Um, but in Interledger, um, we do this, but we do it with, with payments. So let's go back to how our, what the cross uh, currency atomic swap problem was. That's, um, again, that we didn't know whether Alice was going to go first or Bob was going to go first. Well, this is a big problem because a Bitcoin is a large amount of money, right? Um, and if, you, if, you, if Alice makes this one Bitcoin payment to Bob and Bob doesn't pay her, just exit scams her, that's a huge loss. But what if it was just like a really tiny amount? What if Alice just pays 0.001 BTC or even smaller? What if Alice just pays a Satoshi to Bob? In that case, Bob doesn't care if Alice, is, if Al, uh, uh, sorry, Alice doesn't care if Bob doesn't, uh, just disappears now because she's only lost that amount. So what we just do is we just do that, we just do it over and over again. Like, you just make these really tiny, economically insignificant payments, and by doing them all in sequence, just making, just going one bit at a time, um, you eventually make the full payment that you were trying to make, but at no point were you exposed to higher counterparty risk than you uh, were comfortable with. So that's, that's the protocol, that's the basic idea. This is, again, a very small piece of the Interledger protocol, but the part that I'm um, focusing on. I'm simplifying a lot of the ways that that, that that protocol works as well, but more or less, you just split it up into really tiny trades, and um, you, you execute it, um, each of those at a time, so that if at any point somebody, somebody tries to cheat you, you can just exit. Um, there's, this, it's a little, uh, there's a little more going on at the higher layer when you're doing a multi-hop payment here, but it's basically the same principle. Um, it just happens for each, for each of these hops. They're only counting, trusting their counterparty uh, to actually complete this payment. So none of it is enforced by the ledger, but that's fine because it's so small, it wouldn't even be worth it to have it enforced by the ledger. So what do I like about this? Um, because the payment amounts are so small, and uh, including all these multi-hop payments, uh, the griefing risk is very small because you can only be griefed by a really tiny amount. You can have very short timeouts on these packets, um, uh, which means the free option, for, uh, it can be very small packets and they can have very short timeouts because they don't have to be enforced by the ledger, which means both, yeah, the free option problem is also not a big deal because you do give someone an American style call option, but for, it's for an extremely short amount of time. Um, and what I, again, the, as for complexity and what really matters to me is that this works over basically any payment medium that you want, as long as it supports um, small and cheap payments. So it works over payment channels, but it also works um, over just trust lines. It works with bank accounts, which is my relationship with my bank. We could have a, a, a do payments that way. It works if you're tossing pennies across the Grand Canyon. Like, it, uh, literally, anyway, if I can pay you in it and it doesn't necessarily cost that much, then we can actually just do Interledger over it. So um, first question, isn't it, isn't it expensive to do that? Not in payment channels. Payment channels are really cheap. Um, and if your money's not in a payment channel, why isn't it? Like, it's just as easy to put your money into a payment channel on the main chain as it is to put your money into an HTLC. So instead of saying, oh, let's do, this, let's do an HTLC with someone across chain, just say, I'll make a payment channel with you, you make a payment channel with me on the other chain, and we'll, just, and we'll do the, do the uh, trades that way. Um, doesn't it require some trust? Like, barely. Um, you can have literally a small, you can be literally just a, a Satoshi if you wanted. I don't think that's actually the right, probably the right uh, value for most of these relationships, but you can set it based on the relationship between the parties. If it's someone who's completely anonymous, you probably don't want to have a very high one. If it's somebody uh, who is, um, if it's somebody that, that you know very well, you might have a very high trust, uh, trust limit with them. Only your immediate counterparty can cheat you. Unlike in griefing, where somebody way down the line can, uh, with HTLCs can just, can, can grief everybody along the line, only your immediate counterparty is actually able to steal from you, even in a multi-hop payment. Um, and Lightning actually, because I mentioned before, uh, it's, it's expensive to settle an HLC. It costs, again, I'm, I use a number like 50 cents. Um, if the payment's below that amount in Lightning, it just wouldn't make sense to put it in an HLC, so they don't. And this is a dirty secret of theirs. Uh, I'm sorry to out it here, but when you're making payments, like these one Satoshi payments in order to use Satoshi's place, it's using eight Lightning, that's fantastic. You're not using HLCs. It's actually, you're all, everybody along the line is just sort of trusting their immediate counterparty in that. Um, it's, a very, it's very similar to how, the, uh, to, to how um, Interledger does it, and there's some slight differences that aren't really relevant here, but uh, that's, that shows you that, look, people are basically willing to, do, to enter in this amount of trust. After all, in a payment channel, your counterparty can, can grief you for the fees that you have to pay to close the channel, maybe, depending on which party bears those, that burden. So you just say, let's just factor that into the, into the calculus of what am I willing to lose from the, if, this, if this payment channel counterparty cheats me. Um, a lot of people make a big deal about atomicity, what happens if a payment fails halfway through. So one thing is, if, there's, if it's a liquid enough network, you just find another way to do it. You can have them send the, money, send the money that they've already received back to you, 
Or in the worst case scenario, you can just go to the main chain uh, if you're on the same chain and just make a payment to them there, which is the same as the failure case, by the way, of HTLCs, where if there's a problem with the HTLC completing, you may have to actually settle something to the main chain. Um, personally, I, I don't think this is a big deal. Uh, I think we just need to actually have transport layers and, and application layers that are able to tolerate um, and don't freak out about partial payment completion, um, or maybe at least, at least temporarily until it's able to be, to be completed. I also think uh, if you have a liquid enough network, which is easier if you have these really small payments and nobody's griefing the whole thing, it's maybe possible to, uh, to be able to find something, in almost all cases, find another route to, the, uh, to there. Um, Lightning people, because they love atomicity, they make a big deal about atomic multipath payments, um, which is this really complicated protocol for uh, making this work. I think that's bad as well. I actually think, I think atomic multipath payments is the wrong design choice because uh, the way it works is if you have two H, if you want to have it make an HLC that's too large for your channels, you make part of it on one and part of it on another path. And in this, uh, when, when the, the way atomic multipath uh, payments works is that you, the, as part of the protocol, the recipient doesn't complete one of the HTLCs until they've received the other one, until the other one has been routed to them. But in that case, we're essentially asking them to grief the network. We're asking them to do that griefing attack where they hold open an HTLC that they could close. And we're doing it because, what, they'd be confused if they got a slightly smaller payment than they wanted to get. I think, that, I think it's the wrong, wrong trade-off there. So um, the biggest objection, and I think, I, think this one, I think this one has a lot of merit, is that large payments um, uh, take more time. So the, the amount of time that a payment takes is proportional, in the happy case, is proportional to uh, the size of the payment. Um, again, and it depends on, also on what the, what the amount of trust is between these parties. So just back of the envelope, if you, if you have a pretty fast payment channel, and again, here you're working with the speed of light, by the way. Like, if you've got um, uh, computers that are really close to each other, then you know, most, most of, the, of the work in, in a payment channel update is done just by the, the uh, communications. You can get very fast. Um, 20, so you're supposed to do 20 payments on this, updates on this payment channel per second, and you're only willing to trust your counterparty for 50 cents. That's still a bandwidth or throughput of, of $10 per second. Um, which uh, is, isn't that bad. If you're willing to go much higher with the per payment amount, which I think, I think people um, often should be, you could get a lot more. And the other thing is that I'm, I'm not sure Lightning is that good an idea for, um, for really large payments anyway. So this is just a completely back of the envelope uh, chart of wh uh, what it costs to do a Lightning payment, um, payment over a ch payment channel network versus what it costs to do an on-chain payment as a function of, what, of how large the payment is. And the thing is, as a payment gets larger, um, it's just harder to route that over the Lightning Network. Um, there's more risks, and especially this, if you're using HLCs, there's griefing risk there, um, you, and you run out of the low-hanging fruit of liquidity, so you actually have this curve that slopes upward um, in how much it costs and how, and how difficult it is to settle a payment on Lightning the larger it gets. Eventually, it's probably just worth it to go to the main chain or to find some other way to, uh, to make that payment. So I think, I, this is the prediction, I think mostly the, the uh, use case of payment channel networks that works primarily for small payments, doesn't have to be necessarily be micropayments, but relatively um, small payments, because those are the ones that, again, it, it's, it's uneconomical to do on the main chain, but are um, sort of our most, our most effective on, this, on these uh, networks. So other downsides, it doesn't work if you've got non-fungible assets or indivisible assets. So here I've got a visualization of a crypto kitty being sliced into tiny bits, it's disgusting. It just doesn't, it wouldn't work. Um, the other thing is, you couldn't put a crypto kitty in a payment channel anyway. So, um, you can, I mean, or rather, you could put it in a payment channel, it wouldn't be very useful. You can't have a payment channel network for a single kitty, crypto kitty. You really need a liquid fungible asset for that. Uh, anyway, so I don't think I don't think it's necessarily that big a problem, but it, it does matter for some protocols. There's more complex protocols if you if you're trying to support something like gambling, uh, if you're trying to support uh, certain kinds of, of atomic exchanges of information where it makes often makes sense to do something like a uh, like an HTLC. Um, but for the basic uh, use case of payments in a liquid asset across a payment channel network, I think the packetized payment um, approach uh, is, is much simpler and tends, to, and tends to be better for that. So, look, you know, like this is the part where usually people, I, I, would, I was gonna say, like, you know, uh, I like HLCs, we can all live together. Like, I'm, I'm over it. I don't wanna write HLC code ever again, but um, the Lightning work, it does support it. I'm not saying they should abandon it. And we can experiment with both approaches on top of it. You can do a packetized payment on top of Lightning just by making a lot of really small payments on it. That's one of the beautiful things about, the, about Interledger is that, again, it doesn't care what the substrate is. It can, just, it can just work on anything where you can make these small payments. And in fact, there is a, uh, a beta ILP Interledger protocol connect, uh, plugin for Lightning. So you can actually have an Interledger router that is making Interledger payments and it's being settled on Lightning, but again, the 
larger network there doesn't care. It's just you know one of the it's just one of the hops in this in this network. And so I think I don't think I don't think the use of HLCs precludes this kind of usage of these payment channel networks. And I imagine I'm predicting that I think these these kinds of uses will and these and these small payments um, will sort of become an increasing an increasing share of them because of their uh, greater efficiency. Uh, that said, you know, while, while I would love for this packetized payment approach to replace HLCs on, um, on Lightning, I think the biggest uh, advantages come when you're using it for cross-currency payments, and that's where you have the free option problem. Um, and I think, I think the, uh, the, and a lot of complexity when you're trying to support other ledgers. Um, and I think that's what makes Interledger great, is that it doesn't, it isn't as a, nearly as opinionated about what layers uh, it's able to be built on top of. So and I want to say thanks again to Evan Schwartz from Interledger Protocol, who was the person who convinced me, uh, one of the co-inventors of, of Interledger with um, uh, Stefan Thomas, uh, who was one of the, he was the person who convinced me that uh, the right way. None of the ideas in this talk are original to me, actually. This is um, almost all from Interledger, from other people I've, uh, I've heard this from. And I also want to thank um, uh, Lalu and Connor from Lightning for, I had, a, I had just a critical error in this talk, like a couple days ago that they um, that I was arguing with them about something and they and they convinced me to fix so I appreciate that and generally you know, I think I think they're uh, they're absolutely brilliant if I was as smart as them I would probably be writing HTLC code all the time um, but uh, you know I think I think you know the different approaches they totally work so yeah thank you uh, everyone I hope I've convinced everybody um, does anyone have any questions okay so questions maybe line up here uh, so is your claim that uh, if you're attempting to, like, let's, let's maybe redefine this griefing attack and maybe call it like a liquidity DOS? Sure. Is that fair? Okay. Sure. Um, is your claim that if somebody liquidity DOSes the network that it's 24 hours until the network can clear again? It's 24 hours until that liquidity that's been locked up. So if the payment was one Bitcoin large, each of those hops has that one Bitcoin locked up. So there's nothing, there's nothing if you go back to, like, the routes in that, in that uh, flow, there's nothing preventing any of those parties from saying, "Hey, I'm not, I'm not getting anything new, any new updates. I haven't gotten a pre-image. So, can you just rebind, you know, some new coins to a new hash?" So, I guess I don't see how it's possible that like you're going to liquidity DOS those channels for right. the full amount of. So they, time. They, they, the intermediate knows this great question. They can't do that because they don't know what Bob is going to do. Because if Bob actually does complete that, then everybody's going to have to complete it, or they could get cheated by their immediate counterparty. Sure, sure. Okay. So you have to trust your counterparty if you wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I think was missing from the free option discussion on the mailing list was that uh, as priced, there's a free option problem. And, and really, there's a solution where it's just add some premium, right? Like in traditional options contracts, you just add some premium. to. Like, yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to make a payment, right? I'm not trying to enter into an American-style call option. I'm trying to actually just get money from, from A to B, and I don't necessarily want to a, pay an option premium or have to think about that. Sure, but there's, 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 it's in unavoidable, like, that, that value there. So that's, that's how you solve that problem. And, well, look, I, that, that, and then that actually does, if you do that, that requires the party who is paying the premium to actually exercise, uh, exploit the full value of the option. So that would actually force them to wait 23 and a half hours and get the maximum delta that they, vega that they can from the option um, over that period of time. So I think that, that actually doesn't work economically. Anyway. And I guess, if you're I, I, we, we, we can definitely talk after. I'd love to get to, the, to some of the other questions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, really, enlightening talk. Uh, so the question that I had, because you could not go into details regarding packet statement, but there, how can we find out the loopholes? That let's somebody's taking the money, how you determine that on such a large path, where is that person or stop them, right? Yeah, so, so this is my dirty secret, is that Interledger does solve this problems, and the way that it solves it is using HTLCs, but it does it at a higher layer. So it doesn't have the HTLCs enforced on the ledger, um, the HTLCs are just a concern of, the, of essentially the way that payments are routed, so you're able to uh, identify and attest exactly which party was the one who cheated, um, uh, who, who, who actually stole the money. But none of the HTLCs are enforced on Ledger inside the payment channels. Yes, David. Yeah, so you mentioned oh, yeah. um, in your slide that packetized payments uh, cap out at you know, maybe uh, $10 a second. Yeah. Um, but you can, if you ramp that exponentially, so like say add 1% every trade, um, you can cap your losses to a total of 1%, uh, even, even if you get interrupted multiple times. Um, and yes. so if you're doing that, you can transfer like the whole GDP in three minutes. Absolutely. And I think over these long-term relationships, um, you can, yeah, very, very oh. mathematically, 
um, reach a very high, high, high amount of payment in flight with, while capping your total losses as a, as a percentage of the time of your relationship. And I think that, that's sort of a formalization of the general idea that the, your channel counterparty is generally you're playing a long game, you're playing a long-term game with them where your goal is not necessarily to exit scam them immediately, it's to uh, keep this channel open for as long as possible in order to collect as many fees on it as possible. Oh, no. Thanks, David. I've lost my mouse. Cool. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. thanks. Mm -hmm.